Take us away. OK. I'm actually surprised the room is still reasonably full. I thought I might have scared people away, but I'm glad. Good, you're an awesome audience. So taking away from uh, where we stopped, uh, I'm going to talk about stream stream joins. This is something we added uh, all, uh, close to a year ago, and uh, slowly we're seeing some use of it. Uh, it's, and it's important to understand the you know, semantics of how stream stream join works and uh, to, uh, to use it effectively. But by the way, stream stream joins is, uh, is uh, often you just, it's perfectly fine to use stream uh, joins between stream and static data sets, so it's a stream bad join. And that has been supported right since the beginning of structured streaming. So stream stream joins is the only new thing that came in Spark 2.3. And uh, to understand stream stream joins, I'm going to use a very canonical example of ad monetization. You have two streams of data. One is the, the stream of uh, ad impressions on when and where the ad was shown. And then another stream, probably from a different data source, of ad clicks, like when a click was, uh, when an ad was clicked. And essentially, to monetize ads, you need to join these two streams of information uh, to see that which impression led to a click. Now, to, and th this is the most canonical example of uh, stream stream joins that I have seen here. And to you know, express this computation, uh, it may seem pretty simple, but some of the complexities lies in the fact that data can be delayed. So for most cases, your click will actually be generated after the impression has been shown. So, at the data source, there is a certain ordering. But when it, the data is actually received by the engine, it may come totally out of order. That is, essentially, the click data of may arrive at the engine after, uh, much before the impression data has come because of random delays, because uh, your browser did not upload the impression data, because you closed your laptop, but the click went through, and stuff like that. So um, this is, and, and that's what complicates this stream stream join, that you need to take into account these delays and out of order data while providing the right SQL join semantics. So to, to do this and um, correctly, that you need state because essentially for every stream, for both the streams, you need to buffer the clicks and the impressions for some amount of time because you have to wait for the other stream to have a corresponding matched data. So let's start by looking at how to implement this. So you can do a most basic join implementation where impressions data frame joined with clicks data frame where you're joining by the common add ID. Here, when you actually execute this, the streaming engine would buffer all the impressions from the impression stream and, and all the clicks from the click stream as the memory of the stream stream join operator. <coughs> now, it needs to buffer till infinity because, again, it has no semantics on when a particular ad impression is not going to ever see a click. So it cannot throw away any ad, any ad impression, and vice versa. When it sees a click, it doesn't know when it is going to get a corresponding ad impression. It may be arbitrarily delayed. The, so it needs to maintain that buffer forever, as with streaming aggregations and stuff. And that's where watermark, et cetera, comes in. Now, here in this particular case, in the streaming query itself, you need to provide additional time constraints on how delayed the data can be between the click and the impression, and which is allows it to understand when it can throw away a click or throw away an impression. So let's talk about these time constraints. And to, and, and to understand them, let's assume certain characteristics of your data. So let's say your impression can be at most two hours late. So for that, we're going to uh, apply the watermark of delay two hours. Let's say your click can be at most three hours late. So again, you define the clicks with watermark of three hour delay. Now here, the join implementation becomes more, com uh, more constrained, that you are going to join when the add IDs match, 
as well as when the click time is between the impression time and impression time plus one hour. So basically, you're saying that at the, based on that event time, the click can be generated after the impression and within one hour of that impression time. Now, with these constraints on how delayed each record can be and the relative difference, uh, max relative difference between the, uh, the click time and the impression time, the engine can automatically figure out that three hour, uh, that you, it needs to maintain clicks for at most four hours because uh, it can, it will do the math automatically that three hour late click can match any impression received four hours ago and uh, kind of vice versa that a, uh, that a two hour late impression can match with any click received two hours ago and stuff. So it will do the math itself. You don't need to worry about it. You just need to specify those time constraints in the query. And based on what the engine automatically calculates, it will figure out that impressions need to be stored for at most four hours, and clicks need to be stored for at most two hours. You don't need to do this math. And accordingly, the engine will figure out when a click is more than two hour, four hours late, and therefore it, it won't match with any impression anymore and stuff like that, and automatically drop and clean up old clicks and old impressions. Now that was inner join. In the case of outer, we also support outer join, but there's a subtle difference. In the case of outer join, what you want is that, let's say for, a, uh, for an impression, you want to record impressions that did not result into a click for essentially statistics purposes to see what a fraction, what is your click through rate and stuff. So for that, essentially you want for every impression, wait for a maximum period of time until it sees a click, after which it essentially timeouts and returns uh, outer result of impression and null. So for this to work out correctly, the engine really needs to know um, what are those time constraints after which it can give up that this impression is never going to get a click. So unlike the inner join where those time constraints that you have provided are optional for state cleanup, in the outer join, those time constraints, you have to provide them. Otherwise, you cannot do an outer join. Because otherwise, it will not be able to generate correct outer results. Because if it doesn't know when the, uh, it doesn't know the time constraints, it doesn't know when to give up trying to match an impression with a click, it cannot generate the outer results at all. The side effect of this is that you will get the outer results in a delayed fashion. Because for every impression, it needs to wait for the timeout period based on the time constraint provided before it can be sure that it is not going to get a click. Therefore, it can output it as null. So if you, let's say your time constraint says that uh, your click may be at most four hours late, then the engine will have to wait for four hours before it is sure. And therefore, your outer results would be four hours delayed compared to the inner results. That's a gotcha that you need to remember about using outer joins. So, that was stream stream joins. Next, we talk about the final and ultimate uh, operation that we have, which is a hammer for doing any kind of arbitrary stateful operations. So many use cases require this, which cannot be expressed in a, a simple SQL operation. For example, let's say you have a website where users log in and do some activity, and you want to track the user activity to understand user behavior. So it's like a user session, and you want to track for each session what are the things that the user do. Maybe there, there is a state machine and stuff that you want to learn on. So well, for simplicity, let's just say that you want to capture simple actions like login, clicks, log out, what happens in between them. And what you need as the output is when whether the user is active or not, whether he's online or not, logged in or not, and that's the, essentially the user status you want to continuously compute based on uh, the, uh, the actions you're receiving from your website. This is definitely not a SQL operation, and that's where this comes in. So the solution is map group with state, or it's more, uh, more general brother flat map group with state. So, <coughs> and this was added in Spark 2.2. So it's been more than a year, year and a half. But it's available only for Scala and Java only. So 
And this falls in that second category I talked about where there is no automatic state management. So you have to directly control what goes into the state and what, when do you want to clean up the state. You have to control it yourself. Uh, <coughs> so <coughs> it's, uh, sorry. Uh, so this is, by the way, again, those people who have used uh, the old DStream, Spark Streaming, this is a far more uh, powerful and efficient version of the map with state and update state by key that you may have used. So let's see how to actually write an operation with map group with state. So first of all, step one, you need to define a data structure on what your state looks like. So in this case, uh, I will define a data structure called user actions, which is the input where there's a user ID and the action the user has taken. And for the state, I want to keep track for every user whether that user is active or not. So the user status is like my state data structure, user ID and whether it's active or not. Now, <clears throat> the next step is to define how do you update the user status based on an action. And for that, you have to essentially define this function which takes three parameters. One, the user ID, that is going to be your key by which you are going to key the state. The actions, which is the new date, new actions that you have received from your website for that user. And the previous state, which is uh, the, in the previous micro batch, what was the last state of that user ID. And uh, uh, using these three input and in the function, it can, its job is to essentially update the user, uh, the, the state, which is the new user status, as well as output whatever it wants to output. In this case, I care about the last status, so it'll output the same status that it puts in the state. To do that, basically, first, you want to get the previous user status, if there is any. It may be a new user, so there may not be any, so you have to test for that. Uh, you want to basically take each action, and for each action, update that user status. Uh, you may actually want to reorder them in a certain way, basically to make sure that they are in timestamp order and stuff. So those are additional operations you may have to do that, that you have control over whatever you want to store and uh, how you want to reorder things. That's where you can do count-based windows, et cetera, kind of things. Um, and then finally specify that uh, this is my final updated state and return that updated state. Now, this is the function that essentially will be applied on every user as there is new data for that user. And so now you take this function and apply it on a grouped data frame. So uh, you have the user action data frame, you first of all group by the key, which is the user ID, and then apply this function, map group with state, this function. And now, again, this is a uh, operation that again works just like all other data frame operations works in, on both batch and streaming data. So in streaming query, the system will figure out how to keep the state and version the state, all of that that I've talked about. In batch, this essentially boils down to a simple group by key uh, map groups. There is no prior state because it will just uh, process the entire data in a single batch. So it's just a simple group by map group Thing. So uh, they, it will just effectively boil down to a much simpler operation with no prior state and no future state. But it, it works with the exactly same semantics as, uh, as you would expect based on the function you have written. What it also supports is timeouts. Now, uh, timeouts are useful when a particular group uh, hasn't received any new data. For example, if your user has been idle for a long period of time, you don't see any new actions, you want to essentially time out that user, uh, or you want to mark that user as inactive. So that's when you uh, need this timeout function because without this, your function will never be called for that user because there is no new data for that user. So that function is called only when there is new data for a particular user. But this timeout essentially allows you to specify that, oh, do call this function if I have not seen new data for this user for a certain period of time. Now, there are essentially two types of timeout supported. Well, there is three settings. In this case, there's either no timeout, in which case uh, you are on your own. Uh, there is event time timeout, 
where you use the event time and the watermark to figure out when a particular group has timed out. And there's sim much simpler processing time timeout that if uh, uh, just uses the wall clock time. <coughs> uh, so let's talk about how you can configure the event time timeout. To use the event time timeout, you again have to specify what is your watermark delay. And based on that watermark, uh, you, uh, the timeout of every group is defined. So watermark is something um, that actually is defined globally across all the groups. It's, there's a single watermark value across all the groups. But for each group, there may be a different timeout configuration. So the way it works is uh, in your code, besides updating the state, and uh, you also set that this state's timeout timestamp is something. Basically, it could be, let's say, the max timestamp you have seen across all actions for that group plus one hour. So that means you're setting a particular timestamp as the timeout timestamp for that group. And when uh, that, again, the idea is that whenever that watermark, it is, it is continuously uh, going forward, right? So whenever that watermark hits that uh, timestamp value, which, is, which you had set it at one hour ahead, it will call this function once again with no new input. So essentially, in that case, what will happen is that um, uh, you can specify, you can, you have this function called has timed out, uh, with which you can s understand whether this function was called because of new data or because whether there was a timeout or not. And if there was a timeout, then you clean up the state appropriately. So you can just say state dot remove to clean up that state. And this is your explicit state cleanup st uh, uh, state management. So essentially, it, the method has all the API needed to, under, to kind of control what you want to do with the state when there is a timeout, when there is new data, et cetera. And, and I think I mentioned this, that watermark is calculated as the max, based on the max event time across all the groups, but each group may have a different timeout timestamp as uh, you have set in the function for each group. So based on that, it'll, different groups may time out at different points of time, and therefore the function will be called at different points of time. Again, the semantics are uh, present in our docs. It's, it's best to actually really understand the docs and actually try it out yourself. The processing time timeout is actually far simpler. It just essentially uses the wall clock time, and if a particular group has not uh, received any data for one hour of wall clock time while the streaming query is active, then the function will be again called with zero data, uh, with has timed out set to true. Now, the interesting observation between these two is that um, in processing time timeout, if your query, let's say, had a downtime, there was some sort of failure, you, you had a timeout of one hour, but your query was down for two hours, what will happen is that as soon as you start the query, all your groups will hit a timeout, because based on the wall clock time, two hours has passed, which is more than an hour. So that is um, the semantics you need to understand. That problem is doesn't affect in the, uh, the, the event time timeout, because event time timeout is based on watermark, and the watermark moves forward only when it processes new data. So even if your uh, query was down for two hours, it just hasn't processed any new data, when you bring it up after two hours, it starts processing from that two hour old uh, data, so the watermark would move only as much as it has processed. So, so it is much more robust with respect to downtimes and stuff. So that, those are the trade-offs between event time timeout and processing time timeout that you need to worry about when you're writing this. Again, this is a, a hammer for those use cases where you really can't express your computation in terms of SQL semantics. So again, map group with state is some, uh, is like a smaller brother of this flat map group with state. The only difference being that um, in map group with state, for every group, you can output only one record in one micro batch, in each micro batch. Whereas in flat map, just like data frame dot flat map, in flat map group with state, for every group, you can output multiple records or no records at all. So that gives you an additional level of flexibility. So, uh, there are other operations, other options like function output mode, et cetera, that 
um, that you may need to specify. And this is to, for the engine to understand the fact that you're outputting uh, these outputs, whether are these updates or are these records essentially appends to the table. So, and, and with that, you can basically, the engine can reason out that if you're doing, let's say, uh, 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 let's say th this sort of sessionization is using flat map group with state followed by some aggregation. It can reason uh, that whether it is okay, it, it does it make semantic sense to aggregate over updates or aggregate over this. And again, these are essentially the most advanced uh, components, uh, advanced options. So use it as your um, as your business requirements require that. Okay, oh, this was about all about the stateful operations. Now, if you have already implemented it and you're running it in production, obviously you want to monitor them to see whether it's how much memory it is consuming, what is the size of the state, et cetera, so that you, can, you don't run into production problems. So some of the guidelines on how to configure your streaming query such that your state management becomes easier are as follows. So, as you have understood that the state is essentially grouped. And when the state is grouped, it automatically means that you are having to shuffle your data into the required groups. So it's important to set the number of shuffle partitions to a reasonable value, because that determines how the state operations uh, are, the, the latency of the state operation stuff. A good number to have is one, two, three times the number of cores in your cluster. And the trade-off is that if you set this number too low, then you're not utilizing all the cores. If you set this number too high, then the cost of writing out the state to the backing HDFS, et cetera, for fault tolerance, those overhead starts building up quite a bit. So it's important to set it to a, me, uh, a range between one to three times the number of cores in your cluster. And if you want, if, 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 you, if the, uh, that is such that your streaming query is not keeping up with the rate at which data is being generated, then you probably need a larger uh, cluster with more number of cores. And the total size of the state per worker, um, it, again, uh, more the state, more is the memory usage. And since in the default Spark implementation, we keep all the, data, the state data in, in, in memory, that can lead to higher uh, JVM, GC over and stuff. And, so again, you need to configure your executor sizes, et cetera, accord accordingly. Or you can use Databricks runtime with ROCKS DB state store to avoid these problems. Next step is monitoring. While you're running the query, if you want to monitor what uh, is your current state's memory usage, you can either do it simply by saying uh, the query, which is the handle to the currently active query, query dot last progress, which gives uh, information about the last micro batch, the last progress that was made in that query. And you get information about how many rows were processed, what were the offsets in that last micro batch. But you also get information about what was the last memory usage, number of bytes used, et cetera, and, 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 and number of records in the state, et cetera. And so that is like a pull model, like give me the current state right now. There's also the push model where you can register a listener and get the same progress information. And basically, the, if you re register a streaming query li listener, then the engine will automatically, asynchronously call. Every time there's a micro batch completed, it will call the function of that listener and to give you, like, here is the latest progress. Here is the latest progress. This actually becomes much easier in Databricks platform itself because our Databricks notebooks are integrated with that same streaming query listener and with which, uh, and it shows up as graphs in the notebook itself when you have started a streaming query. It shows up both the data rates, batch durations, as well as the number of state keys in the notebook itself. So it becomes much easier to mo for monitoring when you run structured streaming in Databricks itself. Now if you do happen to see that there are very large number of queries, uh, sorry, very large number of state, then uh, you may want to dig deeper that, okay, what operation am I doing that is causing uh, that large number of uh, state rows? And so you can go to the Spark UI and see the DAG of the uh, Spark SQL query, and that gives more information on 
uh, on the state maintained by every state operator. For example, for if you're doing an aggregation, then uh, there will be a DAG node which says that how many rows are there, et cetera, and a, a lot more detail about how the state is distributed across this thing. You can probably figure out skews, et cetera, in the streaming state from by, by looking at that plan. So uh, <clears throat> again, I've already mentioned this, that you can uh, managing very large state becomes tricky because of JVM, GC overheads, and stuff. And that's where our uh, Rocks DB state store in Netflix runtime makes it very useful to keep uh, your streaming query operating smoothly with consistent latencies and stuff. OK, we are in the process of releasing Apache 2.4. And some of the big advantages in this is uh, we have we've lowered the state memory usage for streaming aggregations, especially with aggregations where there, is a, there are lots of aggregations for the same grouping key. So group by, group by key, uh, aggregation one, aggregation two, aggregation three. In those cases, this, there's a much lower memory usage. Uh, we've also added unrelated to stateful stuff, but this for each in Python. We've also added this thing called for each batch in Scala and Python, which allows you to, which essentially exposes each micro batch's output as a data frame, which allows you to do more arbitrary stuff to, the, to every micro batch output. For example, and, and some of the cases where this is very useful is uh, there are many data sources which are uh, designed for batch data but doesn't have an alternate version for streaming data. So you can, uh, earlier, because you could not have used those data sources. For example, Cassandra, there is, Cassandra has a data source and data sync for batch, but not for streaming. But using this, for each batch, you can actually call the batch data source of Cassandra inside for each batch to say that, take the output of every micro batch and write it to Cassandra. So this, this essentially enables uh, integration with a lot more different data sources that do not have native streaming support. The caveat is that uh, you have to reason about your exactly once or at least one semantics yourself, uh, because it may be that some micro batch is executed twice, uh, and so you may have write out the same batch multiple times by, because for each batch will be called on that batch multiple times, and you have to reason about that yourself. The data sources that, like files and Kafka, well, not, not Kafka, but files, uh, they, na uh, they have native support to reason about when a batch is duplicate and therefore guarantees exactly one semantics natively. Uh, then the other advantage of for each batch is that if you want to write the output of your streaming query to multiple locations, that also makes, uh, this also makes that possible because you can take the same output data frame and save to location one, save to location two, save to location three. You may want to cache it in between and stuff to, for making it more optimal, uh, efficient. Anyways, uh, I'm very out, quite out of time and we constantly write blogs and stuff talking about these uh, integrate this advanced features inside structure streaming and so take a look at the databricks blogs for more information all these deep dives etc we do uh, blog about them there's also the programming guide of course and finally questions